Record. Yep, recording and sharing the screen. Pastor Wolf Mueller teaching worldwide Bible class on Genesis chapter 26 and the life of Martin or and the life of Jacob according to Martin Luther. That's what we're after. You will notice, by the way, the move from chapter uh, 25 to chapter 26 is a move from Luther's Works Volume 4 to Luther's Works Volume 5. So we're in a totally new book now. Uh, so that's great. So here, let me give a, a couple of um, verses here that we're going to look at. And then Luther's going to step back again, and he is going to give us a sort of the big overview picture on reading the Bible. And so that's, it's nice to see that. Um, and we can, we can see it with all the text here. So Genesis 26. Now there was a famine in the land besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring, I will give all these lands. And I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham, your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. This word is probably better translated seed, Zerath, and that's a that this seed promise now that the Lord is giving to Isaac is echoing back to the promise he gave to Abraham, which echoes back to the promise he gave to Eve and Adam in the garden, Genesis 3.15. So we're tracking the seed from Adam, Eve, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, David. So that's this, the, this golden thread, scarlet thread, I suppose, that is woven through the Old Testament, this promised seed. That's Jesus. In your seed, in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. These are, this reminds me of the words that David, King David uses in... Um, in Psalm 119, the Lord's word, his voice, his charge, his commands, his statutes, his laws over and over. So here's an account of, um, of Isaac and the kind of basic stuff. So there's a famine, so he, there wasn't enough food, so he had to move around. And the Lord comes and it seems like he's, he's got his eye maybe on going down to Egypt. And the Lord comes and intervenes and says, no, don't go down to Egypt. So you can stay there in Gerar. How do, you, how do you think you pronounce it? Gerar, Gerar. Uh, it's go and stay there. I think I have a, a map here uh, to just give you a, uh, a little glimpse of where this is. So here's the life of um, Isaac. This is Philistia here, this, the kind of Gaza Strip. And there was the, the towns of the Philistines were in here. Uh, Isaac's route is the green route from Berla High Roy to Gerar. And so Isaac is, we're in this chapter, he's making this move here. Let's see if we have this noted for us. What happens if I click that? That's not gonna, mm, there's a well there. I've never been down that way. So Isaac is coming up instead of going to Egypt, which is, you know, over here, he's heading up this way and he's settling down here. That's what that looks like. Okay. Now we're thinking to ourselves, now that's some, just some basic sort of moving around, trusting in the Lord, looking at his family, that sort of stuff. And, and Luther's going to take this occasion of the sort of normalness of what the of what the account is here to rem to remind us of of how to read the bible and he's going to contrast it in fact how to think about god and luther's going to contrast this with the monkish way of reading the bible which is always looking for these extravagant works so so to compare like what the lord has given here to some of the, the, the very pious and popular things that the people were reading in Luther's day. 
like the lives of the fathers. And they were reading about these monks that would go and live in the desert and they would fast for years and years and years. They would do all these kind of magnificent holy works. And compared to all of that, these accounts of of Isaac and Jacob just seem very normal. And Luther wants to highlight that contrast and remind us that this is important for how we think about God. So here, here we go. It has often been stated, we're on Luther on this side. Let me get my pen ready and I can sketch as we go. It has often been stated that in this entire book, the accounts of the fathers are described in a very ordinary covering, as it were and are presented without any splendor or display of their religion, righteousness, and wisdom. Yes, in accordance with most of the inglorious aspect of their household management and their physical life. For what else does Moses relate about Isaac than that he was born to his father Abraham, begot children, tended cattle, wandered about in various regions? Little or nothing is taught there, about prayer, about the monstrous religious practices of the monks. But what is it to me that he was a husband and that he slept with his wife? Are these things to be taught in the church? For this is how the flesh clings to that external and very ordinary aspect when it looks at the life of the fathers and sees nothing that edifies but is only displeased. So again, where Luther is warning about the, the reading of um, the flesh. How does the flesh read? Now, here's an amazing thing just to think about. And that is that probably all of these great disciplines, like even fasting during Lent, which is a discipline to subdue the flesh and to serve the neighbor. We, we fight against our own flesh and we say to the, our stomachs, I mean, this is basic, the idea, basic idea of fasting is we say to the stomach, you're not the boss of me. You know, the stomach growls and we say, in your place, you know, you are to serve the Lord. You serve me so that I can serve the Lord. And I do not serve you. I'm not the, sir, I'm not a belly server. Uh, that's how Paul talks about the pagan. Their God is their belly. They're driven, they're enslaved by their desires. So that fasting is to, is to subdue the flesh. But look at how Luther is noting here that the monks and all of their ideas about their works of super irrigation and all this other, other stuff is a fleshly reading of the, of the uh, is a, it's a fleshly theology. And that fleshly theology looks at the, these texts here, the kind of normal comings and goings of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and says, what of it? That's no big deal. Look, they didn't even do anything special like we do. Uh, later, however, it, the flesh thinks about becoming acquainted with the life of St. Bernard or St. Anthony and men like them, where there are amazing and unbelievable works in the matters of, and I think maybe put scare quotes or maybe not put scare quotes. In, in other words, I don't think Luther actually believes these stories. He thinks that they're fables that are made up about the matters of abstinence, fasting, vigils, where there's no familiarity with women and servants, much less with cattle. It laughs at these ordinary and inglorious works in the household of Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, and devotes its attention to those that are splendid, this is scare quotes, splendid and magnificent. So it's, so it's establishing these two different kinds of works. Are, our, are the good works that we're doing the normal everyday household kind of works or are they the super holy pious works of the monks in the monastery on these accounts uh, or if these accounts are read at times in the churches no one admires them for no one observes the true worth and the true ornaments of these accounts so here you have the contrast there is the in the medieval Roman Catholic mind, there is the beautiful, pure life of the, the spiritual life of the monks. And there is the normal life of the every ordinary day, ordinary person. And the, the, in other words, there's the Pharisees and the not Pharisees. There's Cain and there's Abel. This is the whole history, always working down through this way. 
And Luther says that, look, you can't, you can't read these guys and despise them. This is what the Holy Spirit is highlighting for us. Accordingly, we teach, and this should be diligently and frequently impressed. Luther has been diligently and frequently impressing it on us. I think I must have decided that when Luther kind of says, you got to underline this part, that I was going to put it in blue. That must have been what I decided. That in the examples of the, of the saintly fathers, it should be looked upon as the main thing and the highest commendation that God spoke with them. That's the thing that matters. No matter that they were having, they, they were getting married, having children, driving cattle around, they also had the word of God. And that's the treasure that they had the word of God. This is the point that elucidates these accounts and gives a true understanding of what and how great these dregs and seemingly contemptible outward appearances of the greatest saints are. For where the word of God is, there one also finds true faith and true works. For everything is done in the word and under the word. This is I mean, if you wanted, if you just wanted a little window into the, into the, into the mind of Martin Luther, here you have it. What, what does he, what does he see? What, what makes him unique, a unique voice that speaks so clearly for us? And that is that you could have all these outward things. You could have a city that's full of workers and things happening and all sorts of other stuff there's even churches and church bells and there's soldiers and wars and castles and everything else like this and you see all these things and what is of value in the middle of all these things one and only one thing the word the word luther is a theologian who's looking for the words of institution I, i've that's a little aside, but it's a helpful thing that we, we hear those, that phrase, the words of institution, we think, oh, uh, baptism or Lord's Supper. But Luther's looking for the words of institution for everything. Why do a, a bride and a bridegroom get married? Because the Lord, inst he instituted marriage. Why do we have a family? Because the Lord instituted family. Why is there a government? Because the Lord instituted government. Why do we teach the children? Because the Lord instituted teaching. Looking for the, look, why do we preach? Because the Lord instituted preaching. And there's a word of institution for all those things. That's where the, that's where the value is. That's where the treasure is. Your word I have treasured above all things. And, and Abraham might look like, a, I'm sorry, Isaac we're talking about. Isaac look, might look like a, just a normal guy having a family and trying to avoid the, the plague and everything or the famine but he has the lord's word that's the main thing barb says same today we revere those who achieve in sports politics riches but disregard the farmer homemaker intact families exactly we here's where the fancy is and here's where the not fancy is and and uh and luther is directing our eyes to the right spot and saying the thing that matters is again the word This is, a, this is one for the highlight reel right here, you know, to post up on Twitter. For where the word of God is, there one finds the true faith and true works. For everything is done in the word of God and under the word. The other things which are apart from the word and without the word are performed only in accordance with our own will. They are nothing else than the dregs and dung before God. So you want to be fancy by all your monkish ways? Well, you, if you don't have the word of God, it has no value at all, no matter how highly the flesh and the eyes esteem it. For this reason, all the lives of the monks, no matter how showy they may be in the eyes of the flesh are nevertheless altogether nothing. The outward appearance of sanctity was great in Anthony, Hilarion, and many others. Luther liked to read this guy. Some of these men spent their lives in fasting, some in unnatural vigils till they were 70 years old. The flesh, the heart, the eyes of men are taken in by these remarkable feats. Think of like Gandhi and all of the Buddhist rigor. But see whether there is a connection here with the word of God. Ask Anthony 
whether he has a word by which he has been commanded to go into the desert and torture his flesh, he'll say no. But to me, this seemed good and pleasing to God. But this is the main thing, that this should be conspicuous in your works, Anthony. That without this, your uh, entire life of yours is death and only the choice of your flesh. It is your own decision and nothing but ostentation and madness on the part of carnal men. Consequently, the Holy Scriptures, in its accounts of the fathers, I got to go down here, gives praise primarily to faith in the word. So what does the Lord praise in Abraham? Faith. Isaac? Faith. Jacob? Faith. In fact, that's that should remind us of of, he, of Hebrews 11. Remember Hebrews 11? That's a beautiful chapter. What do we used to call that? Is the hall of faith. And over and over, it's talking about the Old Testament guys here. And, and it says, um, for by it, by faith, now this is the, almost precisely what Luther's talking about. For by faith, the people of old received their commendation. So what does God commend to us about all these fathers? And what should we see in the text as that which is commendable? Faith. By faith, we understand the universe was created by God. By faith, Abel. Uh, let's, let's just see all the, those, the, the faithful that are listed here in the chapter. We got by faith, Abel. Uh, by faith, Noah. Even when he was, uh, no, that's no, Abraham's, uh, Moses was going to be commended for his faith, even as a baby. By faith, Abraham, a lot on Abraham. By faith, Sarah, back to Abraham. These all died in the faith. By faith, Abraham offered up Isaac. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of his sons of Joseph. By faith, Joseph made mention of the Exodus. By faith, Moses, when he was baby, so there's baby faith right there. Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, uh, et cetera, et cetera. By faith, they kept the Passover. By faith, the people crossed over the Red Sea. By faith, Jericho fell down. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, didn't perish. Time is falling short to tell Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms and forced justice, obtained promises, etc., etc. In fact, look at look at this list. It's kind of amazing. Uh, it seems like it's getting bigger and bigger, better and better. They conquered kingdoms. They enforced justice. They obtained promises. They stopped the mouths of lions. They quenched the power of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. They were made strong out of weakness. They became mighty in war. They put foreign armies to flight. Women receive back their dead by resurrection. And then it takes quite a change here because it seems like it's getting better and better. Escaping, kill, escaping death, being made strong, winning in war, being raised from the dead. And then all of a sudden, some were tortured. You're like, wait, wait, wait a minute. I thought that maybe faith would help me to avoid this. Refusing to accept release so they might raise again to a better life. Oof. Suffered mocking, flogging, chains, imprisonments. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with a sword of whom the world was not. That's a, my, one of my favorite, favorite phrases here. They were sawn in two, killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. So that the Holy Scriptures and accounts of the fathers give praise primarily to faith in the word. Hmm. The word of God sanctifies everything inasmuch as it is holy. Yes, holiness, truth, and wisdom itself. And the life that is governed by the word is true righteous wise and eternal life if it lacks the word it lacks truth light and wisdom before god and all its doings are works of darkness another text for the twitter reel the highlight rule here from luther it's fantastic this reminds me 
of this kind of funny thing that Luther talks about. I just, I just thought about it. So let me see if I can pull it up here. This kind of funny thing that Luther talks about in the large catechism uh, when he's talking about the word of God. So that must be third commandment. And it's talking about, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And he's talking about holiness. And he says, the word of God is the, yes, is the holy thing above all holy things. I found it. Look at that. The word of God is the true holy thing above all holy things. Now, Luther uses in this place a special word that means the relic, heiligatum, the word for relic. So oh, here, it's given us the footnote. Is going to, you don't even need me. The footnote's going to teach it. To understand Luther's meaning, we read it like this. We used to be taught to revere relics and other holy things, but the word of God is the true holy thing. The word of God is the relic above all relics. So in the medieval church, you would go and you'd, if you went to a holy place, you could be blessed. If you touched the relic, we were in, where were we? We were walking around the back room of the church in Spire. There's a cathedral in Spire. And uh, that's where the Protestants protested and became Protestants. Second Diet of Spire, 1529. There's a big cathedral there. We were there. So I got to go there twice a few years ago. And the first time we were there was on Pentecost Monday. And the bishop fills the fountain out front with wine. And everybody goes, you can get the wine from this fountain and drink it. And you couldn't go in the cathedral. When we get back, there was a second time, there was no wine in the fountain, but so you could, we could go and look around. And so you're wandering around the back rooms and everything. And all of a sudden there's this case and in the case is just a bone. It has like a ribbon around it. It looks like a present that you want to give to the dog. This big, and you look at the sign and there it is. This is the bone of some saint of something or other. And it's, there's his leg bone and you grab a hold of you, you know, you go and you do the right devotions at that particular bone. And then and now you receive some blessing from it. So the reliquy blesses you in this way. This was a big deal in Wittenberg. Remember that in Wittenberg, on All Saints Day, November 1st, the King Frederick the Wise, who had the largest relic collection outside of Rome, would put all these relics out on the table in the castle church. And there was, they found the, like the little directory for the for the relic uh display and if you did the proper devotion at all of these different relics you could get hundreds of thousands if not millions of years out of purgatory so the idea in the middle ages was that there were these holy places holy people holy things and by by praying in their presence by using them in these ways you yourself could participate in their holiness and Luther comes along, he says, this is just nonsense. The holy thing that makes us holy is the word of God. That is what the Holy Spirit has given, his holy word that gives his holiness to us. So the word of God is the true holy thing above all holy things. It's the only one we Christians acknowledge and have. Sola Scriptura. That means the Bible is our sole relic. You see the thing that's happening? Though we had all the bones of all the saints or all the holy and consecrated vestments gathered together in one big pile, they couldn't help us in the slightest degree for they are dead things that sanctify, it means make holy, sanctify no one. But God's word is the treasure that sanctifies all things. By it, the saints themselves had been sanctified. So the saints, you know, whose bones and whose clothes were gathering together to make us holy, Luther says, well, what made them holy? Answer, the word of God, which we have also. It's fantastic. So, so Luther's saying all that there. Same stuff he's talking about here. Uh, let's see. Someone said, oh, Trish says, do we know how the opponents address the relic argument? 
we do know how they addressed it. And someone who remembered could tell you. But this person has forgotten. Uh, you know, the, the, if I were, so just the Lutherans talked about the relic problem in the Augsburg Confession, and it came up in the Catholic response. It came up in the Council of Trent. And the Council of Trent worked to try to abuse some of the, because even the Catholic Church could recognize we're a little too crazy about the relics. Uh, although it kind of comes in phases. But, uh, but so it tried to modulate that, but it also would argue things like Paul's handkerchief or Paul's shadow, things like this, where the miracles were worked. And so they, they still have the idea that for someone to be declared a saint, the, the, there have to be two miracles performed in their life and then two miracles performed by their relics, by, by, their, by their stuff after their death. So, so that's a problem. Uh, you, the place to look on that, by the way, would be like a Chemnitz examination of the Council of Trent. Do you guys have that? I have it. That's what I'm looking for. Where'd it go? Ah. I knew I had it close at hand. So there's a four volume set, the, uh, the examination of the Council of Trent by Martin Chemnitz, which is a beautiful work. So, um, if you're rich, you should have this. If, you, if you're not, if you don't, it's, I, cause I think it's like 300 bucks for the set of four or something. If you can buy a couple, get volume one and volume two. Those are the best ones. Uh, or the other option is you can borrow your pastor's copies. You just have to return those things. Uh, or you, if your pastor doesn't have, this is my best advice on this, is if your pastor doesn't have a set, so you go, pastor, could I borrow volume two of the examination of the Council of Trent? He says, oh, I don't have that. You should get it for him and then borrow it from him. So that's my strategy. Okay. Uh, we're, we haven't covered as much as I was hoping. So let's, let's kind of press through here. If, you could, if, I, if, I, could, uh, if I could move us along, uh, we'll see what we can do. It's my fault. You guys haven't. So there's my fault. Uh, although marriage, so here's Luther's back to the, back to the plot, back in, in Genesis 26. Marriage is an unclean kind of life because the copulation of the man and the woman cannot take place without carnal uncleanness. Tending cattle is a filthy business. The life of the government and of subjects is highly impure and abounds in vices. Many sins flock together there. Excesses of individuals as well as personal vices in addition to those that are general. So he's saying, look, the domestic life, the life of the farm, the life of public uh, of politics is just messy. It's a messy life. And this idea of the flesh to be clean, you know, uh, the monastery, the monks were like spiritual OCD or like um, they, they just, they want to, everything has to be so clean. But you can't, but the, the problem is, is that the Lord is working in the mess. Nevertheless, God has richly honored all of this and has ordained it in his word. He ordained marriage. He ordained looking after cows. He ordained the government. And if you hold fast to the word, you have already been cleansed of all your uncleanness. So we don't need to worry about the, the messiness of this stuff if we have the Lord's word. Finally, Luther says, nobody lives without sin, but so great is the power of the word that it devours all these. The word of God is a sin devourer. So you can say, if I live my married life with my wife and children and peace and fear and trust of thee, I know that all is well. First Timothy 2.15, one of the tough verses, but a beautiful one. Paul says about the life of spouses that the woman will be saved through bearing children. How? They continue in faith. It's the first power of the word. So the first power of the word, Luther's going to talk about three powers of the word here. And the first power of the word is that it devours sins and forgives sins. Beautiful. The second power of the word is that it, it, it brings it beautifies our own life by giving us something useful to do. The word not only brings about this kind of life itself is saintly and pleases God, but it also stirs you up to all kinds of virtues and highly praiseworthy works. 
not again the useless works of the monks, but works that are actually helpful. For it is not idle, the word of God, provided that it's in your heart according to its true meaning and understanding. It will remind you to think about calling upon God, praising him. So prayer, first commandment, second commandment, third commandment. It will make you a priest and prophet of God, third commandment, word of God. One whose sacrifices will be most pleasing to God because his eyes have regard for faith. The horrible monks do not see this effect either. So first, the monks miss that the word of God forgives sins in the midst of mess messiness. Second, they don't see that the word of God calls us to a, act to a true holy life of praising God and having his word. In the third place, if the devil notices that you have the word and are confident that your life is pleasing and acceptable to God on account of the word, he will not rest, but will put you in, in your way trials and afflictions of every kind, even in the most trivial matters. You will experience faithfulness, faithlessness on the part of the household, hatred of your neighbors, the death of your children and of your wife. Luther lost two of his daughters in his own life. All these things will happen in order that your faith may be exercised. But if the word is not there, the word, the word, the word. Impatience and displeasure follow because of such an irksome and miserable kind of life. Just as we hear many who exclaim that they entered into marriage, not because God led them, but because the devil urged them to do so. So there's a despising of all the gifts if we don't have the word. I heard about, uh, I heard about a, a, a pastor who, this is not a Lutheran guy. This is kind of a funny thing. He said, uh, when I became a pastor, I so, had such a problem with people coming and they wanted to be counseled by me as if I was supposed to fix their problems. And I didn't know what to do. And then I was reading Psalm 1 and it said, blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, etc. But he, his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. And so when people would come to him for counseling, he'd say, do you read the Bible every day without fail? And if not, he'd say, do that and come back in three weeks. <laughs> That's what the, here's the promise that you'll be blessed. And he said, no one came to me because I don't, he's, he wasn't sure because it's fixed their problems or because they didn't want to do it. But this is, this is the problem is that it's the, it's the word of God, in fact, that, that brings all of these blessings to us in the midst of all of our troubles. It's fantastic. Okay. Uh, same thing. I'm skipping down here to get a little bit further. God has declared his word to all and has commanded everyone to attend to his calling. That's our, that's our work, to, to attend to our calling. Your husband, are your wife, are you a, a child, are you a parent, are you a pastor, are you a hearer, are you a worker, or are you a neighbor? What's your calling? Tend to it. Hence, in order that you may overcome those difficulties and annoyances, whether in marriage or in the government, take care, first of all, that you have meditated well on the word of God in which the government is richly established. So do I have a word for that? Remember, remember how I was, we were talking earlier about the words of institution. Where, has God instituted it? So that we, we go and consider how the Lord is the one who has established all these good things, and now we are to rejoice in them. So if I'm, if I'm a magistrate, I'm, a, I'm meditating on the fact that the Lord is the one who's given the sword to the state. Same likewise in marriage. It's a, just a really good practice. I think going to weddings are so helpful for married couples because you get to go and meditate on the God's gift of marriage. Whether one is a manservant or maidservant. That's the old way of saying you have a job. <laughs> Whether a teacher or a pupil. They're sure of their station and the will of God. Now, look, look at this. This thing right here, th this being sure of your station. I'm going to highlight this like this. See that there? I got, I'm going to make it a fatter line here. So this sure, th this is this mystery that, that is all over Luther but it's so easy for us to miss. And that is that the law brings comfort 
and it brings comfort by bringing confidence. The law gives us the confidence that, that we are doing the right thing before the Lord. Now, we might be messing it up. We might be doing it foolishly or even sinfully. But the fact that we're doing it is not wrong. When I stand up to preach a sermon to the Lord's people at St. Paul or Jesus' death, I might preach error and false doctrine, but I know I'm supposed to be up there preaching. Now, that doesn't mean because I'm supposed to be preaching, I preach whatever I want. No, my preaching is to be bound by the Lord's word. But the fact of the preaching, I can have great confidence in because the Lord is the one who established it. He said, preach, and he put me in the office. So when I come up to the altar as a Christian and I take the body and blood of Jesus, I can have, I mean, can you imagine doing something so bold to eat and drink the body and blood of Jesus, but I can have confidence that, that that's the right thing to do because Jesus commanded it. This is this, there's this, and this is a really deep theme that's here in the text of Luther, and it runs all through, it's, it's through the scriptures, and it's really highlighted in the Reformation. The monks did not have a word from God. They didn't, so that they could never be sure that their station was the will of God. Anthony and Bernard and all these that left the families and went off into the mountains and everything. Husband and wife have the command. Manservant and maidservant have the command. Teacher and pupil have the command. Government officials have the command. But the monks have no command. And so they can have no certainty in their work or the things that they're doing. Do, do, does this all fit together? This is this words of institution. I'm looking for these words of institution so that I know that I'm standing firm on the thing that I'm doing. Take hold of the word and bring forth fruits worthy of the word, and you will see that afflictions and trials follow at once. Uh, what Luther in other places called tentatio, affliction, unfictum. In fact, how are we doing on time? Um, these three things are what Luther says make a theologian. We've talked about this before, lots. But I suppose it doesn't hurt to. So the first is the word and meditating on the word of God. The second thing is prayer. These are the three things that make a, a theologian. And then the third one is affliction. Like, hey, uh, Luther, I, I, I just would like to say, you know, I think the third thing that makes a theologian is happiness. <laughs> nope. Or I think that, you know what the medieval church said? You had uh, uh, oratio, prayer, meditatio, word, and then they had contemplatio. And that means this, this sort of vision of the, the beautific vision in heaven. Carrie asked how to spell contemplatio, and I told her, I'm thinking about it. Is that, was that the joke? I made a joke about that, something about that the other day. How, is it? Anyway, Luther says, no, it's affliction. Affliction. That's what makes a theologian trouble it is good and he's and he gets this from psalm 119 and all of these verses like 54 62 or something it was good that you afflicted me where the word is bring forth uh, uh bring forth fruits worthy of the word you will see that affliction and trials follow at once but prayer follows these so look at the look at the logic here so you have the word and then you have the works and then you have and then you have the affliction that follows and affliction leads us to prayer and the Lord answers our prayer and he delivers us. And then we praise him for that deliverance. This is, so this is the, this is how, this is our Christian life. And at the same time, we're able to bear the cross. This cross is what afflictions are and offer sacrifice of praise. The monks neither want or able to do. They are interested only in peace, the belly, and pleasure. None of these other Christian things.
There you go. All right, let's get a little, let's cover a little more. Um, I'm going to skip down a few because I didn't highlight this. Under the most gorgeous dress of the hypocrites, the monstrosities of unbelief, spiritual pride, envy, and filth lie hidden. It has the name and outward appearance of a spiritual life. Let us open our spiritual eyes. You. This is a phrase that Luther uses often. In fact, I've got, I have somewhere around here a half written essay on Luther's understanding of spiritual eyes. You guys can vote in the chat if you would like me to finish it. Um, and I'm not going to pay attention. I'm hoping you're saying it's not interesting, but it's actually quite profound because we have our earthly eyes, which look on things according to the flesh, but then we have the eyes of Jesus. Here's where this comes in maybe most beautifully. I'll tell you, do you remember the story of the, of the girl who's dead and Jesus comes into the house and all the, all the people are mourning and, and Jesus says, stop the mourning. The girl is not dead, she's sleeping. And all the people laugh at her. And, and Luther has this beautiful sermon. He says, to the eyes of the flesh, the girl looks dead, but to the eyes of Jesus, she's alive. And who sees things rightly? Who looks on this girl right? Everybody or Jesus? And the answer is Jesus. Tabitha Kum, and she's raised. So now we look, for example, let's just take this example. We look at ourselves and we see ourselves dying, weak sinners. But how does Jesus look at you? Jesus looks at you clothed in the, the righteousness of his blood, perfected, cleansed of all, <clears throat> of all your sins, ready to live forever. And who's right? Jesus is right. He sees you rightly. And he sees your neighbor. And here's where this is really interesting. Because, um, I mean, just to maybe take some examples from the Gospels. If you were to see Jesus at dinner, and here is the Pharisees, and here are the tax collectors. And you say, well, who is closer to the kingdom of God? And we say, well, it's got to be the Pharisees. These tax collectors are sinners. But Jesus sees things rightly. He sees the danger of the Pharisees and how far they are from the righteousness of God. And he sees the repentance of the sinners, how close they are to the righteousness of God. So, so, so spiritual eyes see things like Jesus sees them. So, so we can say, so we just, we, we just, it's one of these discerning questions. I remember I was, um, here's a specific memory. I, uh, it's a doxology memory. Doxology is this group, uh, doxology.us. You can check it out. It's a, this, it's the center for care and counsel. It's to care for pastors and to help pastors to care for their congregations. It, it's to, in, in some ways, it's to reboot the historical understanding of pastors, soul doctor, Zales Orga. And uh, they do conferences mostly. If, you're, if you are a pastor, you should go to the doxology stuff. If you have a pastor, you should send them to the doxology stuff. It's really helpful. A lot, so many pastors are like, this saved my, uh, saved my ministry, saved my life. Anyway, I'm on the Collegium, which is like a theological think tank. So we're sitting around. This was six, seven years ago. We were at some room at the seminary in St. Louis. And Dr. John Kleinig from Australia was there. And we were doing, we were having a kind of a round table on how to minister to people with dementia, Alzheimer's and other debilitating brain diseases. Like what does ministry to them look like? That was the conversation. And into the midst of that conversation, Dr. Kleinig says, what does Jesus want us to learn by afflicting so many of his people with Alzheimer's. Wow. Now, I don't know if we can answer that question 
But we can ask that question. And even asking that question totally changes the whole plot, right? What is, how does Jesus see this thing? How does, how can we look, for example, with the eyes of Jesus on COVID as an example? I mean, how, what happens if I look at COVID not through the eyes of the flesh, but through the eyes of Christ? And how do I think about it differently? Now, what, what Luther is pointing out here with this eyes of Jesus thing, the spiritual eyes, that's what that is, is that, uh, is that if you look on someone who looks holy with spiritual eyes, you can see through it. And if you look at someone who looks wretched with spiritual eyes, you can see through it. Let us open our spiritual eyes and judge their spiritual vileness according to the rule and analogy of these accounts. Moses makes no mention of fasts or vigils. You hear only that Isaac travels from Hebron to Gerar, suffers hunger, seeks a dwelling place. But what great faith one sees there. What inestimable patience. What unbelievable forbearance, goodness, and kindness one sees. All these virtues shine like the sun and the moon. For me, indeed, it would be impossible to sow such remarkable obedience. If I had two sons, a wife, domestic, such great multitude of cattle and servants, and did not have a foot breadth of ground to set my foot on, what would I do there? I would surely give up the control and management of the household and run away. Ha! For to be so unsettled and uncertain, and yet to stay with wife, children, domestics, and cattle is a sign of an amazing faith that could make bread out of stones. This is this the godly, godless do not see. So I'm looking on Isaac. We are being trained to look on Isaac and the fathers, not with the eyes of flesh, but with spiritual eyes and see what's going on there. Got it? Oh. <clears throat> we are getting close to time. There's a, let me just mark it here. I think we can take this up. I, I don't, so again, we're, this chapter tw uh, 26 is really about Isaac, not about Jacob. And so I just want, want to skim over it, but I don't want to miss because Luther's giving us these tips on how to read the Bible and think about these things. And that's really what we're doing. I, I don't want to miss those. So I'll mark it there and we'll pick up here uh, next time. Let's say a prayer. I'll stop the, then I'll stop the recording and then we can uh, check in and see how everyone's doing. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would grant us your Holy Spirit and your word and that you would close the eyes of our flesh and open the eyes of our hearts that we might know uh, you and your goodness to be working hidden in the plain, ordinary things that you give to us in the word, in the church, in our families and homes and neighbors. And we would see ourselves and the word and the world as you see it. And that we would rejoice in this wisdom and in this comfort. We ask this all through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord. Amen. The eyes of the heart, I mentioned that in the prayers. That's from Ephesians chapter 1, 2. That's from Ephesians. And that's where Paul is talking about the same thing too. That we look on things with the eyes of our heart. So.